Hello, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Institute of Politics. My name is Isabella L Lashley. I am a sophomore studying history and literature at the college, and I'm also a member of the JFK Jr. F Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located both on the park and JFK Street side of the forum. In the event of an em emergency, please walk towards the ex exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming co-chairs of the Student Forum Committee, Robert Fogel and Ryan Tierney. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Fogel. And I'm Ryan Tierney. Uh, and we are the departing co-chairs of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Student Committee. Tonight's forum is the last of the semester and of the year. The final installment of over 50 discussions our dedicated committee and staff have hosted this year. Through these discussions, we have continued to fulfill our mission to foster a consequential, nonpartisan dialogue on Harvard's campus, prepare our students for a life of servant leadership, and to imbue them with a dedication to the common good. The custodial staff who set up the forum space every day, our media services crew, our photographer, Martha Stewart, Brian Conroy and Ryan Hickey, our security team, Dejanae Miller, the forum coordinator, Aaron Goldman, the forum director, and the members of the student committee. Let's take a moment to thank these individuals. None of what we do is possible without all of their hard work. It is in this spirit that we are honored to welcome you to tonight's discussion, which focuses on the story behind the critically acclaimed blockbuster film, Killers of the Flower Moon and the journey of the Osage Nation. Our panelists tonight include Chief Jim Gray, former Principal Chief of the Osage Nation, Hepsi Barnett, an HCAS alum and former Chief of Staff of the Osage Nation, and Wilson Pipestem, uh, Osage head right owner, honoring National Board of Governors. The discussion will be moderated by Professor Joseph Colt, Director of Harvard Kennedy School Project on Indigenous Government and Development. Please join us now in welcoming tonight's panelists to the stage. We hope you enjoy this evening's discussion. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this evening, we are honored to have three preeminent leaders from the Osage Nation. The recently released film, Killers of the Flower Moon, powerfully tells the story of the murders of dozens of Osages by non-native conspirators who were seeking control of the oil and gas wealth that the Osages were accumulating in the early 20th century. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon is uh, routinely uh, attributed to Martin Scorsese. And that's pretty true. But these three individuals also played, a ma play, played major roles in the, making of, in the making of the film and in the powerful resurgence today of the Osage Nation. For each of our guests, the film was very personal and incredibly impactful. What happened at Osage and what has happened is the nation has rebuilt itself, carry lessons for nations and citizens everywhere. In fact, each of our speakers here at a School of Government and Public Policy has interesting links to the Kennedy School and the Harvard Kennedy School Project on Indigenous Governance and Development. So let me give them full introductions. With a background in journalism, the Honorable Jim Gray served as the elected principal chief of the Osage from 2002 through, through 2010. During that period, Chief Gray led an incredible effort in governmental and constitutional reform that has been honored by the Honoring Nations Program of the Harvard Project, and it has laid, it has laid the groundwork for an inspiring strengthening of the Osage Nation and its people. 
Chief Gray played a major role in redirecting Mr. Scorsese's filmmaking so that it captures the Osage reality. And Jim is a direct descendant, if you've seen the film, of Henry Rohn, victim of one of the pivotal murders in the film. Hepsi Barnett is a 2000 Masters in Public Policy Administration graduate of the Kennedy School. And in fact was the teaching assistant. <laughs> was my teaching assistant in the school's course on indigenous nation building. After she left the Kennedy School, proving that maybe there is a life after the Kennedy School, Hepsi became chief of staff to Chief Gray. In that role, she was absolutely indispensable in successfully shepherding through a huge program of governmental reform of the nation's government. If you've seen the movie, there's a scene in which the home of one of the pivotal individuals is blown up. Hepsi tells me that you can see your own mother's house in Fairfax, Oklahoma, in the immediate background. Wilson Pipestem is the, one of the premier attorneys of American Indian law in the United States and a member of our Awning Nation's Board of Governors here at the Harvard Project. Wilson is from the Gray Horse District of the Osage Nation. That's the place where the murders depicted in the Killers of the Flower Moon took place. When he and others at Osage learned that Mr. Scorsese was planning to make this film, Wilson famously called a community, community meeting together in Gray Horse. And it was at that meeting that the process of educating the filmmaker began along with the working relationships that ultimately allowed Osage to control the portrayal of Osages and indeed much of the story itself. So with those introductions, I'm now gonna make you guys talk. <laughs> um, and of course we're going to talk about the film, but I'd actually like to give people here some context. Um, in the film, you get to see Osage about 100 years ago. Um, but your nation isn't something of the past. <laughs> what would you like people to know about Os the Osage Nation today? You know, if you just thought, what would you like people to, to, to know about what the Osage Nation is today, politically, culturally, economically, whatever? What do you want them to know? Jim? Uh, I would like to say, well, first, thank you for having us here. This is an incredibly uh, significant forum for us to have this discussion. Um, I'm, uh, I would say the, the, the biggest challenge, I think, in answering that question for me is, is that uh, we're still here and we're still evolving. And the fundamental aspects of tribal sovereignty was one of the things that I spent most of my tenure, those eight years, pursuing and securing for our people with uh, uh, I know you left it out of the introduction, but Wilson was our lawyer and lobbyist at the time we had to get federal legislation passed in order for us to be able to uh, reorganize the in our entire nation and, and enroll literally thousands of Osages who had been left off the rolls for generations by federal law passed in 1906. And uh, I know I'm just covering a lot of uh, surface area here, but I can easily go into great depth, but we only have an hour. so. Uh, but the fact that all those things happened at that time made it possible for us to be able to build the institutions, the nation building that is so often used in, in this institution as a, as a principle that we organized an entire nation to work together and, in a, creating a constitution that was built on unity. And, uh, and because of that, we've, we, developed and heavily invested in uh, gaming, and we use the money from gaming to invest in securing our language, our culture, our education, our health care, and our land acquisitions. Those were the principal fundamental aspects of what we did once we got the economic means to be able to invest in those things. And it just so happened that when Hollywood come calling, we were ready. <laughs> Hepsi? What do you want people to know? Well, I guess I want people to know that, uh, you know, a lot of friends of mine have gone to see the movie and they are just flummoxed about how could this have happened? And if you know a little bit about our history, um, and most people don't, it's that obviously, you know, we had a flourishing, prospering, 
nation of people for thousands of years. And um, then I try to tell people it was really through failed federal Indian policy that made it possible, that created the situation that made it possible for our people to be murdered in that way. Mm -hmm. And lots of times they'll say, well, what are you talking about? Uh, in uh, trying to uh, make Oklahoma a state, when we moved to Oklahoma, and I won't go into this great detail, <laughs> but uh, when we moved to Oklahoma, we so had sold our reservation in Kansas and bought our reservation in Oklahoma. And that created a lot of legal advantages that Wilson could talk forever about. But it created a situation for us where because we had paid for our reservation instead of being forcibly removed to Oklahoma like most other tribes, you know, we were in a situation when they, um, at the turn of the century, uh, <coughs> through the uh, allotment or the Dawes Act or the allotment process, you know, we were sort of holding up statehood. And our tribal leaders finally agreed to allotment, but only if uh, all of the allotments went to Osages and wasn't opened up for white settlement like the rest of Oklahoma was. And uh, you have to go to Joe's class to learn about the Dawes Act and all of that. But uh, uh, that created a situation. So instead of uh, us going under the Dawes Act, we had the, what was called the 1906 Osage Allotment Act. And, be, and that was passed by the United States Congress. And as a result, they illegally abolished our government that we had in place at the time and created a very simple tribal council system that didn't have a lot of power or authority and really eroded our inherent sovereignty at that point. And uh, one of the things embedded in the 1906 Osage Allotment Act is a provision uh, allotting the, the mineral estate, because we had paid for our reservation, we retained the mineral rights, Obviously, right after the turn of the century, they discovered oil, as you saw in the movie. And um, basically, they uh, created a very simple tribal council system, allotted all the land to Osages, and then divided up the mineral estate into 2,229 shares, which that was all of the Osages at the time, and then basically stipulated that the only way you could get a share of a head right was to inherit it. But they neglected to stipulate that you needed to be Osage to inherit it. And so that created the opportunity for our, a lot of people to come in. And that's how the murder started, was through intermarriage, which you saw in the film, and then you know killing off all members of the family or attempting to kill off all members of the family so that then those would be inherited by non-Osages. And about 25, 26% of those head rights were then outside the tribe. And it, from between 1906 and 1925, when they corrected that, after all of the murders, uh, the federal government then corrected that uh, policy to say that, and stipulate that only Osages could inherit those head rights, but that created this opportunity. You know, I remember in Joe's class, he used to always say, where there's an opportunity for corruption, there will be corruption. And he was so right about that. You know, and uh, under that federally imposed system of government in, uh, uh, that still exists today, and Wilson can talk a little bit about that, uh, the 1906 Osage Allotment Act is still in place, and in many ways, um, you know, we still suffer as a result of it. Uh, you saw in the movie where uh, Molly talks about saying her name, Molly Kyle, incompetent. Well, here sets three incompetence before you now, because still to this day, my mom passed on about two years ago, and I had to sign a paper that said I was incompetent in order to get the uh, legal advantages of inheriting uh, her share of her head right. So it's a very, very complicated story. And, you, and, and that, I feel like that comes out in the movie, but it's so much more complicated than that. So I'm going to pass it on to Wilson. 
<clears throat> well, I mean, where we are today, I think, is, you know, it's, as uh, Hepsi said, we are under federal law incompetence because of our Osage blood. And so things have changed and gotten a lot better, but the systems that are in place that you see in the movie are essentially the very same. All right, so the idea that there is one, the Osage reservation is about 1.47 million acres. There's the uh, oil and gas that's there. Enormous amounts of oil were produced out of there. And so, and it's mainly oil. I mean, it's not, it's not really oil. And, it is oil and gas and other minerals, but it's been oil. And uh, so the production of oil led to this incredible amount of colonization by the United States into the <coughs> Osage reservation and Osage people that we're still digging our way out of that. Just the idea is, I think, the, the incompetence of, uh, because of Osage blood is still a remnant of that. But the government of the Osage has been reformed thank to, thanks to the leadership of Principal Chief Jim Gray and the hard work of Hepsi Barnett, but the institutions of colonial government into the affairs of the Osage make us the, still the most colonized tribal nation in the United States. And that's because of oil and the creation of these laws that uh, said, we're going to come in here and make sure that you don't have very much uh, authority to exercise when it comes to uh, your own homeland. So as one example, to my knowledge, we're the only tribe in the United States that has a provision in federal law specifically that says we are required to offer for lease at least 25,000 acres of the reservation for uh, oil and gas development. Whether we want uh, to or not. Yeah, whether we want to or the secretary, if we don't, the Secretary of the Interior is, is directed to, to go ahead and do that. Uh, we had a form of government that, uh, where it said you will have a principal chief, you will have an assistant principal chief and eight council members. Uh, so it imposed a form of government uh, on the Osage. It said we're going to take all living Osages that existed, that were alive in 1906, and all of those individuals will get a surface land allotment. Now, it also says that uh, the living Osages at that time would get a pro rata share of the proceeds from minerals production. Mm -hmm. Now, I have learned over time that uh, the word head right doesn't appear in federal law until the 1940s. It was just a living Osage who was on that list that received revenues. Now, over time, the Bureau of Indian Affairs made a really tragic decision related to our Osage people. They decided that, well, what happens when we have one of those original Lattes or individuals who was on, on that list in 1906, what happens when they pass on? Well, they decided that that person, that Osage person becomes, and their right to receive oil becomes property. And so that property right uh, became something that uh, they decided that, well, because the 1906 Allotment Act presumed the impermanence of the Osage, it said in 25 years this is all going to go away. There's no longer going to be an Osage tribe. There's no longer, as a, as a government, this mineral estate that's held by the tribe. Whoever owns the surface will get the minerals beneath it. So all of this will expire in 25 years. So. You know, as depicted in, the, in Killers of the Flower Moon, there was this run on Osage lives because the Bureau of Indian Affairs allowed non-Osages to inherit those property rights. So uh, there was also a run on Osage surface lands because they wanted access to the surface land because they thought in a few years we're going to get access to the minerals beneath that land. So, By hook or crook. Yeah, so. By crook. Yeah, and, By crook. and tragically, the uh, United States did not defend the reservation status of the Osage Reservation. So, this was land set aside by treaty and purchase by the Osage Nation government from the Cherokees. Uh, you know, there's a story that, that says in the film that, you know, they got this terrible land. You know, this is, we got the worst land. And then they found oil. But that wasn't our traditional story about that. Mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, as uh, Jim Gray, the Gray family, they're descended from a man named Wadayanke that said, mm -hmm. they said, we're going to ask him to, and two other men to go look at this land they want us to, to see, uh, which is now our current reservation. And they came to that land and came back and said, we think this is suitable for us. 
My dad used to describe him as a prophet. He came and looked at the land and said, there's something here that's going to be good for us. Now, some of our Osage people have interpreted that as, uh, as meaning, well, he, he knew there was oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my dad used to say, no, it was the sovereignty of the Osage people that yeah. was there. And that's what's going to sustain us. The oil is, um, you know, has been an important part of our history. It's an important part of our present today, too. Uh, we, again, we have this same system where individuals receive, head, receive oil revenues. Um, the mineral state is still held by the United States in trust. Uh, and the United States is still our trustee of that land, and it's still trustee over our, uh, the accounts we have in our, in our lives, and everything you have to do to pass on something. My son Truman's here. One day he'll inherit from me, but you've got to go through all this process with the Bureau of Indian Affairs till they say it's okay. We've got um, furniture at our house, and my grandmother, Rose Pipestem, who was an original Lottie, she uh, that uh, furniture on the back of it has branded on it USID. Yeah. And there's uh, saddles and furniture. Mm -hmm. And if you were a restricted Osage, you didn't have authority over your own things, your own money, uh, your own money then you wanted to buy something. So, uh, you know, she had to justify to somebody else the purchase of that. And then it came to the Bureau of Indian Affairs for her to come, to come get. So, Osage lives, it's not just the tribe that's had this imposition of the federal government on us, it was the lives of individual Osages, and you saw that depicted through the character uh, of Molly Burkhart, brilliantly played by Lily Gladstone, uh, with the dignity of uh, that uh, Osage women today uh, are, um, that, that, the, the, uh, that they are today, she was able to, um, to portray that in the character of Molly Kyle. But, I was going to ask you all yeah. if you were disappointed that I didn't look like Lily Gladstone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I, I'm, I'm a little bit. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Osages today, we're still digging out of that. I think that's my perspective, is that the leadership of Jim Gray led to this. We had to go to the Congress, United States Congress, where the courts had said, you don't have the power to change your own government. You don't have right. the power to determine who your own membership is, who your own citizens are, that was imposed by definition of the federal government in this era of control over oil. And uh, can we, I just add yeah. something? You know, when we started the government reform process, you know, it was an opportunity for us to do, as Wilson's saying, is we, we knew through everything that had happened, through the murders, through uh, trying to have our tribe disestablished, that, that we needed to do something. And through the vision, really, of Chief Gray, you know, to say that the time has come for us to change this and take control and self-determine our own future. During that time, and, and Wilson probably can talk more about this, but during that time, when that happened, gosh, uh, you know, I was in my 50s then, um, and I still wasn't a member of the tribe because in the 1906 Osage Allotment Act, they had tied membership or citizenship to the tribe to the head right or the, the uh, pro rata yeah, property, yeah, property, ownership. property yeah. ownership. So in order to become a member of the tribe and be able to vote or run for the tribal council, uh, you had to have a share uh, to the royalties from the mineral estate. And the only way you could get that was to inherit it. Well, I was so happy. My mom lived until just a couple of years ago. So during that time of Osage government reform, I still wasn't a member of the tribe. And that was not uncommon for you to be in your 50s or 60s. Yeah, Mark Freeman. Before you became seventies. <laughs> a member of the tribe because we couldn't control our own membership. And so one of the things, you know, Wilson led the legal effort to get that change that the United States Congress to say that, you know, to reaffirm our inherent sovereign right to determine our own membership <clears throat> and our own form of government. And we had to go back to the United States Congress to make that happen. And, you know, really wouldn't have happened without uh, yeah. Wilson pipes them 
uh, you know, he's a big time lobbyist in Washington, yeah. D.C. <laughs> Proudly wears He's on a first name basis with Nancy Pelosi, okay, you guys? Yeah. <laughs> so he knows what he's doing. And we were, we were, we're just so fortunate to have the talent of Chief Gray and Wilson to make that possible. Can I ask, um, for all of you, clearly the big governmental reform that you did kind of culminating in the 2006 constitutional reform, what you're saying you know, is driven by never again, we're not gonna let this happen again to us. We're gonna take control of things. I wanna know, I'd like to know and have you talk about, the film is very powerful. <laughs> What, what's the impact, what impact is, is it having inside the Osage Nation in terms of your citizens, and even, even the younger citizens for whom they probably didn't know a lot of this history, a lot of them. Uh, what's the impact inside the nation of this film and your guys' objectives of essentially rebuilding the nation? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first cut and I let the rest of them jump in. Because I think it's a really complicated way to answer this because um, it's, there's a generational shift among those ages of the younger ones, like you said, um, that may not have been exposed to this. And then there's folks in like our generation who grew up hearing these stories. But unfortunately, uh, this, this historical moment, and let's just say that the trial of William Hale was the O.J. Simpson trial of the 1920s. It was in every major newspaper in the country. And yet within just a few short years, it just disappeared from the public knowledge. It wasn't taught in public schools. It's still not taught in public schools. Not and in Oklahoma, not anyway. least not in Oklahoma. <laughs> um, and so I have a, a different point of view than I think some of the other folks on this panel do, but it was one of the things that I had felt connected to by virtue of my great grandfather, but also being a former chief and laying so many foundational things in place before I left office, like a cultural and language program where we were teaching it to people in the public schools at the time, it was becoming much more of a larger enterprise uh, by the time the movie came to Osage Country. And they, once the, the, the act of persuasion was taking place to let us help you make this film because these are our people. These are our ancestors that you're talking about. And there are some things in the FBI files and there's some things in David Grant's book that capture this story, but not all of it. Some, most of what you need to know about these people and about Osages generally, culturally, spiritually, are in this room of Osages that are here to talk to you. Mm -hmm. and. Let us help you. Nobody wants you to fail, you know. And that was the the premise. And so, the act of working collaboratively with the filmmaker in all aspects of the clothing, the language, the the music, the the observances, the ceremonial scenes in there. That these are all drawn from the conversations that came. Mm -hmm. And what ended up on the screen. 99% of the viewing public won't even know the amount of time and attention the filmmakers spent learning the Osage way of life to capture it in this film. And they deserve a lot of credit for that because they didn't do it because of the, you know, the money and nobody would know the authenticity that went into this. But trust me when I tell you this, they spent a lot of time with our people and, and it shows on the screen as somebody who's Osage, who grow, grew up within the culture of the tribe, to see so much of it on the screen was powerful. It was as powerful as anything I've seen in cinema. And uh, for, for whether or not it, 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 it translates to have an impact on the general public, I don't know. Maybe that's a question for all of you, but as far as this Osage is concerned, that collaboration triggered what I would call almost a cathartic process among Osage people who had been silent about this for most of their lives, to somehow embrace it, to make peace with it, to come to terms with it, to channel it, 
And the results have been everything you can imagine from any group of people, from anger to peace, to frustration, to a drive, to push the tribe harder to take greater control over their own story. These are the kind of emotions that I've seen since I've seen this process play you're out. You're touching on this, and I'll put it to all three of you. Uh, uh, there's been some controversy in a sense of some of the reviewers, both native and non-native. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is once again the powerful white institution, Apple, <laughs> uh, with the great Martin Scorsese, non-native, telling an Indian story. You're touching on it, Jim, but I wonder how you guys responded. It's a touchy issue, and we're actually here to talk about those kinds of things. How do you guys respond? What's your take on that, Wilson? You know, I would say that <clears throat> as a general matter, telling stories about Native people, ideally it would be people from that own, your own tribe that have that, but to, tell, to be able to do that. But I think in this circumstance, it's a major step forward in storytelling regarding Native people because Martin Scorsese, we engaged him. There was no, there was a book, there was a script. Our gray horse people, there was, a, there was a lot of Osages thinking there's nothing we can do about this. They're gonna do what they're gonna do. Well, our gray horse people and the, folk, the murders that occurred that were part of the conspiracy related to William Hale happened to Osages from gray horse. And that's, Hepsi and I are from gray horse and Jim's uh, grandpa, Jim uh, or uh, Henry mm -hmm. Rome, we're from Gray Horse. Now you've got Gray Horse, Hominy, Pahuska. Gray Horse is the smallest and most remote community. And so the William Hale conspiracy murders happened there as a general matter. And so, uh, you know, the community from Gray Horse, we're talking about direct descendants of people that were had to deal with that. And so they, we got together to say, what are we gonna do about this? This is coming at us. There's a tornado coming at us and we can see it. What are we gonna do about it? And we had an amazing discussion among our people about mm -hmm. what do we need to do? And there were people that uh, stood up and said, you know, my grandpa was a, uh, a, a uh, dignified man and my dad watched him die in front of him and he never recovered from that. A lot of stories about the impacts on, human impact on people from the community. As one man, he said, you know, I'm just half a man because the things I should have learned about our traditions from my grandfather, uh, he, they killed him, so I, I learned some of our women's traditions. There were story after story, and we decided that we didn't know anything about Martin Scorsese except for, you know, just knowing him as the, uh, you know, in, the cultural icon that he is. So we decided to send a letter and say, we want to talk to you about these things. You're, we're concerned about depictions of drunk Indians and rich Osages and this idea of incompetence somehow that's real. Um, and, so, and so we sent this letter and we heard back and said, he says, yes, he's coming. He's going to come talk to you. We had to try to figure that out. We heard that this letter that we signed, folks from Gray Horse and we sent, got seen by a whole lot of people. They said Leonardo DiCaprio saw it and Mark Ruffalo saw it. And they called Scorsese and said, you have to talk to them. Well, so we had this dinner. We tried to figure out, you know, how do we, how are we gonna do this? Are we gonna, uh, we had a, this meeting and we even heard, I got a call, a uh, Navajo lady said, when is the dinner at Gray Horse? Oh, <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, ma'am. Turns out she was an actress trying to find a way. <laughs> but uh, people were hearing about it. And so uh, we had a discussion at the, at our, in the community saying, what do we do if people who aren't from Gray Horse come to this dinner? Somebody said, well, let's have the Osage Nation police there. We can have a sign up that says only folks from this community. And one of our elders said, you know, We've invited him to put food on the table here. And when we talk about that Osages, that means that we're gonna uh, do our best to cook our best food for you. And then we're gonna enjoy ourselves and eat that food. And then we got something we wanna talk about with you that's very mm -hmm. serious. So when we talk about putting food on the table like that, he said, if somebody comes and they're hungry, we need to feed them. And everybody said, you know, that's right. It's exactly right. So. We had this, uh, our Gray Horse community came together and we came together in a way that, well, we could have had 
singing and dancing, and we know how to do all that really well, right? Uh, but we decided that's not what we're here for. Mm -hmm. we're, this is, we want to do things the way that we authentically do things. If we had trouble with someone else in the community and you wanted to work that out, this is the same way we would do that. So Martin Scorsese came, he, um, he got in line and he shook hands with everyone. And uh, he sat down and you know, when you go into that environment, the women, the cooks, are, they're in charge, right? So they said, he's gonna sit here and here's who's gonna sit where, you know? So we did things the way we do. We had man pray in Osage language, we ate. And Mark, Mr. Scorsese, remember, he said, I'm overwhelmed. I didn't know, I was told what was gonna happen. He was, you know, was kind of briefed on this, but I'm overwhelmed. I wish my wife was with me tonight. And we had, uh, I watched him get some Osage food and take a little bit of it, and put a little bit here and get another bowl and put a little bit on there. <laughs> get a little bit of this and put it on there. And then I watched him take a couple of bites and then see him go, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> he, Better uh, than it looks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we enjoyed ourselves. That was what, it, and that's what was the purpose of it is to eat and enjoy ourselves. And then we talked about the reasons we were there and mm -hmm. the hard things, their stories, the hard stories that people had about their grand folks. Um, and, you know, because this is, you know, for our generation, this is our, my grandma was 15, 16, 15 years old when Anna Brown was murdered. So this is not so far back that these things are, you know, that we, that we aren't foreseeable. We can't, our generation today can feel those things that were happening. And so people stood up and talked about their concerns. And you watch Martin Scorsese, which I learned, he's an amazing listener. I mean, to mm -hmm. see him taking this in and people who talked to him in different uh, ways when he was getting to know Osage is that people say the same thing. He's a remarkable listener and he uh, wanted to hear what we had to say. And it was, he said, you know, he's later said that was an important evening mm -hmm. in the changing of the story. Now, there was a critic some criticism of, well, you had Ernest Burkhart, you married Molly Kyle, and there's no way that he actually loved her, doing all those evil things to his her family. And, but the, the granddaughter of uh, Ernest Burkhart and, and Molly Burkhart was at that dinner and she said, there's no way you'll ever convince me they didn't love each other, whatever, however it started. And so Scorsese listened to her. He listened to her and it changed the film. So a lot of those stories that are among families and uh, uh, that, you know, are hard because my grandmother, I didn't grow up with stories about the Osage murders because uh, Rose Pipestem would say, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. Yeah, and we, I didn't we never talked about it in yeah. our family. It was, yeah. and we it didn't was, have we a choice about, but, in our family because yeah. uh, Henry Roan was already in the public domain because of the FBI story and the trial and all that. So but, it, it, but it, I think it, it was, I was raised with this story. But I was, I, you know, I didn't ever understood that. I remember my grandmother, my dad was a lawyer, Indian rights lawyer. And that's, I went around with him. That's what my, always where I was going to go and where I wanted to go. But he would also, when I was 10 years old, drag me to court so I could go along with him. And whenever I stayed with my grandmother, she'd say, I don't want you being a lawyer like your dad. Don't <laughs> do that. And... She said, I don't, don't get involved with the Osage Nation. Don't get involved with that. Don't be involved with that. And, fi and I said, why? She said, somebody's going to do something to you. Yeah. She was in the mindset that it was, she was being protective of me, and that's what I heard as a kid. But because she didn't talk about that all the time, her saying that was because of the real fear that she experienced. I mean, yeah. if you read the stories, if you read the book and saw the story, uh, movie, you know, Osage just bought dogs and put a lot of lights up around the house because they were getting scared of trying to, they were trying to defend themselves. A lot of people moved away. And just got out of there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But for people like our folks, my grandmother, they lived with fear that I never understood until I read the book because she wouldn't talk about that. Yeah. So my son who's here, we don't sit around and talk about that era. Now we do because the book has kind of brought all this to light and the film has but it wasn't like it was a regular 
conversation because we were taught not to talk about it. It was like cathartic almost. It was a process mm -hmm. that each individual Osage family had to kind of find a, find a way to make, come to terms with it. Yeah. You know, we know it happened and it was just difficult, you know, but, to explain. But I, but I think it is so painful. You know, I, my mom, uh, who just, you know, was an incredible woman, she negotiated a contract with Apple to use her backyard for the filming and then they had to come back and do another shot. And she said, oh, oh wait a minute, we need a new contract. But <laughs> so, you know, she was pretty together, but it was incredibly uh, painful because my grandma, just like uh, Wilson's, that was during her time. And even for my mom, you almost have to skip a generation because even for my mom, it was so painful for her to talk about or read the book. And um, she passed before the movie came out, but. You know, I seriously have my doubts whether she would have seen the movie because it just was so oh, yeah. painful for her. That my, my first experience with really talking about what ha happened during that time period was when I became involved with government reform. And we had a woman elder on the government reform commission, uh, Mary Jo Webb, mm -hmm. who had done a lot of research. She was the first Osage that I knew uh, that really had the courage uh, to speak up about what happened and try to educate other Osages about what happened. And she had done a tremendous amount of research and written papers and like snuck them into the Fairfax library so that people would know what happened, you know, and then they would be destroyed. And she started getting threats to her life, but she just had tremendous courage and tremendous wisdom and when I was on the Osage work with the Osage Government Reform Commission you know she pulled me aside and said you know you need to know about this you need to know what happened in order you know for us to move into the future you know we have to know where we came come from and um, you know she just was just just an incredible woman let me let, me, uh, uh, let the audience ask some questions of you, of you all, I'm sure they have lots of lots of questions. There's microphones there, there, there uh, upper and, and lower. So, anybody have any questions? Please go to a microphone, and we'll call on you. And uh, uh, we'd love to hear what, what you know any questions that, that you all have. Let me let me ask about as people come up, if you'd like. Um, you know, you talk about the the kind of deep impact, and this is obviously very personal for you all. Do you think ultimately the movie is giving a, a positive push to the kind of rebuilding of the nation that you all undertook with the 2006 constitutional reform and with the citizenship changes and everything else? Or what, what's your sense of what it's doing politically? I have done probably more media in the last 90 days than I ever did in eight years as chief. And <laughs> He's all because famous. of this movie. I mean, it's like, get up, get up. He's on Nightline. Get and, up, get up. He's on Good Morning no. America. Get up, get up. And I'll, I'll say this: uh, he's signing autographs after you. <laughs> yeah, no. okay. I didn't. I didn't have. Um, I've never missed an opportunity. Whenever talking about this film and this mm -hmm. dark period in our history, without, I don't leave the interview there. I try to bring it forward to the changes that we made. And, and, you know, Lisa Ling did a docu-series on us and ran on CNN a couple of years ago. And I just said, you know, the thing is, is that we, we were victims then to not just bad people doing bad things, but bad federal policies. And, and since then, um, we have made substantial legal changes in how we govern ourselves and how we operate. And it has done enormous good for our people to, to reclaim that which was taken from us, whether it's buying land back or reclaiming our language and our culture and our heritage, investing in education for our, our youth to the tunes of $10 million a year across the country. And we've been sustaining that for the last 18 years. And so I can look back and see enormous things, but when confronted with this question, I always try to put it this way. I said, we, we, we were victims then, but we don't live like victims today. 
we're, 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 we, we're still grappling with some of the ghost of that past. And we're using the sovereignty of our, of our tribe today to be able to address those in a more positive way. Just recently, we, last year, we had a, a sesquicentennial, which is the 150th uh, anniversary of our arrival to Indian Territory where we bought our reservation in 1872. And so that event was like a, a celebration of Osage art and language and culture in our history. And that period of time of the 1920s had, we'd put it in a, in a perspective, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. there were good times before and there were bad times before and there were bad times since then. But in the sense of how we, we don't use that darkest moment to define who we are today. We use it as a guide to never allow ourselves to be that vulnerable again. And that's kind of the, the big message that we, we're trying to convey today is that to anybody I've talked to and who's asked me about it, I try to end every interview on that topic for that very purpose. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it gets in there, sometimes it don't. Yeah. But, we, we are the, you, you know, we, we, we had the privilege of being a part of really making the changes needed for us to move forward in the future. And I, when the movie was coming out, I called Chief Gray and I said, you know, who we are today as a reformed nation exercising our sovereignty, we're the epilogue to that yeah. story. You know, this is who we are today. And, you know, it's not perfect, but it's evolving and continuing to evolve and it can now because we were held for a hundred years in a very static place. And now we have the opportunity to take control of our own affairs and determine our own destiny as a people. And that is tremendous. You know, Joe always says, sovereignty matters. I walked in today and saw Joe and I said, you changed my life, man. You know, mm -hmm. being able to come here and learn what I did and be able to apply that to something so much greater than myself. Oh God, yeah. There's a question back there? <laughs> Please give, it, give us your name and ask questions. Hi everyone, I'm Isab Isabella Lashley. Um, I'm a sophomore here at the college. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the role of youth and elder <laughs> leadership um, in the telling of stories like these. Um, native po populations in the U.S. tend y younger than non-native pop populations, um, and I was wondering the relationship between elder le leadership in telling these stories and making sure that they're not forgotten, um, but also the role of the ever so large youth pop population in trying to um, make make ch ch change and educate the public about the s stories and histories. I want to I want to say a little bit about what happened with the Osage Nation in my first my second term as chief under this new constitutional form of government. We embarked on a thing called strategic planning, and basically I knew going in that I was going to be the chief of a tribe where 70% of the population that I'm in charge of, that I'm, I'm the chief of, have no previous knowledge of being politically active in their tribe. And so we engaged in a, in a process, what we called strategic planning. Well, overnight, you have, yeah. you have to understand when I said, you know, I, at that time I wasn't a member of the tribe. Right. Under the old form of government, we had just short of 4,000 members. And once we reformed the government overnight, we went to 17,000 members. Yeah, so like three that. quarters of the tribe were disenfranchised up to that point. And even though on paper, they were members of the tribe, up here they knew it because they could vote and all that. But in here, they, it, hadn't, it hadn't connected yet, you know. And a lot of it was dependent on the outreach that we embarked on with our own people, no matter whether they were on the reservation or off the reservation. We went through another series of town hall meetings, spending all day with our tribal members, many of them younger, many of them who had been left out of the entire, pro 
I didn't know you were here. Jonathan Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Like, <laughs> and uh, I didn't know. And we made, this, we made this effort. We, w we didn't just communicate. We over-communicated with them. <laughs> we engaged them and we had this team of teams of youth and elders working together to build the kind of public community interest in coming up with a long-term solution in six general areas health education culture and language preservation environment and natural resources governance and justice and economic development in these six areas we pulled all these ideas out of all these meetings and synthesize them into projects that could either be done short term, mid term, or long term. And, and once we did that, we put it back to them in a report and said, did we get it right? Is this what you've told us? And every one of them had come back with different suggestions and different, sometimes it was a thumbs up, sometimes it was like, you forgot this, you know, kind of thing, but we adapted it we didn't embed it in law. We did it consciously not to do it in law because we didn't want to obligate future chiefs and future congresses in a, in a plan that was etched in stone that was in move. What it did was that it gave them a guide and all the future chiefs that followed me continued to follow that guide because it already enjoyed enormous community support of not just the shareholder Osages, but also the newly enrolled Osages who had been left off the rolls. And there was a certain, like when I said this constitution was built upon unity, that's what I'm talking about. It was the first time we actually unified as a tribe around things that for years and generations we didn't even put a lot of attention to. That's why all this attention went to culture and language preservation and buying our land back and, and, and educating this whole generation so that they can graduate any state school they could get themselves accepted in can graduate without any debt. And that took an enormous sustained commitment of not just my administration, but every administration that's followed and every Congress that's been appropriating and voting to appropriate that money because it is enormously supported by the people. Outside of Wilson, that, I don't know. Yeah, Wilson, I mean, we did everything we could. So, uh, yeah, just listening to my own kids, I mean, a few years ago, you know, Elderly Osages, for the most part, they're very protective of the system that's in place with oil and revenues, and they rely on those revenues. Young people don't care about that. They care about clean water. Yeah. And so at our home and on the Osage Reservation west of Skytook, we bring water in because we got a couple letters saying it say the, your water's got something in it that you got to be careful about. And so uh, the young folks are going to change everything. I mean, we're still in a state of relatively new involvement of climbing out of these ideas. Of, but, you know, there's, there's an old mindset of well, just let the Bureau of Indian Affairs handle yeah. those things. And that is what we're growing out of. Like self-governance, uh, we'll mess it up. We'll mess that up somehow. Yeah. And, uh, but our young folks, are they don't accept that. They... they they're more, they're more concerned about clean water and self-governance and sovereignty and exercising of authority. And why would we let the federal government continue to carry things out that we can do infinitely better, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you're seeing our young folks who, um, they also have more access. If you want to learn Osage language, it's not just relying on family. You've got institutions that will support that. Yeah. If there's something about our culture that uh, you know, was, you know, there's not just certain people in the community. The, the, the institutions of Osage government can help with that. So, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see the, the change in mindset. Our older Osage folks uh, are defensive of a system that is as colonized as it can possibly be in Indian country in the United States because that's what they know and that's how they've gotten by. But our young people don't care about that very much. Very cool. And so, um, watch out. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> say, wait, I think we have time for one more question back here. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Daniel Acey. I'm a staff researcher here uh, at the university. And I'm a member of the Osage Nation. Yeah. And 
I am so, so honored to be here. Um, I, my siblings and I, my mother, we became members in 2006. <laughs> um, and my, my grandpa, who was a head right holder, recently passed away. And you know, we're in this phase of the signing the, my mother, the incompetent. Yeah. Um, but I just want to say the, I, thank you for what you have done for our nation. And my siblings and I, we've benefited so greatly from the education funds. I wouldn't be here at Harvard if it weren't for those funds, if it weren't for that support. Um, and the, out, the cultural outreach, I, I grew up reading the Osage News uh, with my mother. Um, and this, it, it's, it's strange having all this attention on the Osage now. Um, I'm sure you can appreciate that, but I am, um, I'm grateful that it's, that it's happening and that we're using it as a chance to move the conversation forward. And it's inspired me to not marginalize that part of myself, but to help move the conversation forward and um, use this, our, this limelight moment for as the horrible circumstances that brought it on us, but taking what we can and making something of it. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say thank you. It's, I've, I've never been so proud to be an Osage. Oh. Thank you. Please, you guys get the last place. Go to Wilson. One, one quick thing. Yeah. So one thing about the film that I think has been really good is that, you know, there's things that I think they're easy to criticize that I would say that among our Osage people, we need to talk about those things first. But other parts of it, we see ourselves in it. And yeah. some of the critics need to understand that um, for a lot of Osage people who told stories that were very personal to them and who told, uh, used their expertise related to clothes or told stories about, their, uh, about tradition and stories that, that were now are in the film, be gentle with people. Because those, you know, those stories are, you know. Yep. They're woven through the movie. Throughout the movie. Yeah. And I've seen the movie three times. I saw the first time, it was just like, look at there. We see everybody you know. You right? recognize all then these the people. Then the second time, it's it kind of hit me, yeah, hit me like a ton of bricks. a lot of these scenes. Yeah. <laughs> and then the third time, you see everything about this masterful piece of art. Yeah. That maybe they didn't include this or didn't include that. But... There are so many little things in there that I think are for Osages, that are from Osages, that are told in the story that you're not gonna see. Yeah. And uh, so that's what we should be, more conversation we have, the more opportunity we have to s talk about those things. Because there are things in this film that get to Osage culture at, the, at its very best and lessons for the rest of the world yeah. and all those sort of things. But, um, they're in this film. Now there's things, again, with things we could criticize, but I think the parts of it, that so much effort went into it from Osages that um, those are, there's still stories to be told from the way they made the film and yeah. what they, they put in there. And uh, you know, my, one of my favorite parts is, is uh, you know, Molly is waiting on her sister to come down the stairs and she tells Anna, you're my wealth, right? So that's a story of Osages about how they think about wealth being a sister, not about money. This idea that money is wealth is a new concept, but the idea of having a sister being a source of wealth was what she was expressing that came from Osage story and Osage tradition. Well, if you're just watching it and don't, appre and don't understand that and can't appreciate that tiny little piece I think Scorsese and Lily Gladstone, who had some room to develop her character, listened to Osages mm -hmm. and included they things throughout it. They would not have got that out of the book or the but FBI. The, but those are things that are yet to be, we need to talk about because you say, how are people reacting? We're still early into this. Yeah. We're still early into all these things. So you gotta see it more than one time, or I had to, to see a lot of these little things in there that are from us and for us. Sure. Any closing remarks for us? Well, I, I just wanted to say, you know, sort of tying uh, what we were able to do with government reform and the movie, I just wanted to say that, you know, watching the film and seeing Robert De Niro and Lily Gladstone uh, speak Osage and seeing Leonardo 
DiCaprio trying to speak Osage. <laughs> um, you know, I know that that wouldn't have been possible without Osage government reform. Yeah. Because we had very few speakers left. Just a handful. Just a handful. And if we hadn't been able to take over control over our own affairs, and Chief Gray hadn't had the vision to put tremendous resources into saving our language, those folks would not have been speaking Osage on that screen. Yeah. And when you say, what's the difference you know, between living under that old imposed system of government and taking control of our own affairs, you know, that's a tremendous difference, you know, putting the resources where we <coughs> see fit to be put the resources. Yep. It's gonna look really different than what the BIA sees fit. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I'm so grateful. Jim, last words? <laughs> um, see the movie if you haven't. Um, <laughs> I hope we did a nice presentation. I hope you all take something from it. Um, as an as a institution of education and higher learning and international affairs, um, I think this story fits neatly in your agenda. Um, I hope you all can find uh, a place for it in your bookshelf or in your moving going choices. It'll now be streaming on Apple soon. So, you know, we're, <laughs> no excuses. there's no excuses now. Um, but for us being invited to such an important facility as this institution, I, I thank you for making time for us. Well, I think we all thank you. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.